So I'd first like to thank uh, Tricia, as well as all of the staff at ACMS for the invitation and for all of the logistical support as well. So before we get started to talk about movies and art in the socialist era the, uh, of Mongolia, the first five or 10 minutes of the talk may be a tad bit on the dry side, and I apologize for that. But I find it very important for us to be, maybe I'll just do this, for us to be clear and on the same page about what we mean when we use certain terms, like the term ideology, which is going to be the main conceptual reference of my talk today. So in common usage, the term ideology is often an accusation leveled against one's opponent. If one is called ideological, it means that one is contaminated with bias, unable to see empirical reality directly, but instead looks at life through a veil of dogmatic belief, and even worse, perhaps driven by the passion of ideology, is willing to go to dangerous lengths to impose one's vision on reality. Speech accused of being ideological is speech that is not worth listening to or taking seriously. Of course, the person who accuses others of being ideological believes him or herself to be standing safely on the opposite shore, empirically grounded, free of prejudice, a person whose ideas are indeed worth listening to and taking seriously. This binary opposition, however, between what is ideological and what is not becomes even more complicated in post-socialist contexts such as Mongolia. It is widely believed that ideology shank, it is widely believed that ideology sank with the ship of socialism and that democracy is celebrated as liberation from the coercions and constraints of ideology. Here in Ulaanbaatar, where the Lenin statue was removed in 2012, and I believe relocated to a five-star hotel in Terelj, uh, Lucky Lenin. Uh, the former mayor, Batul, was quoted as saying, quote, Mongolia had suffered at the hands of communists, but now has moved to create an open society, end quote. Batul's sentence posits a watershed historical moment that was crossed during Mongolia's peaceful democratic revolution a movement supposedly away from ideology. The implication is that we have now entered a realm that is ideology free, that political liberalism, parliamentary democracy, and capitalism are not themselves ideological and are located, as Francis Fukuyama famously put a long time ago, at the end of history. In a recent book critical of the socialist period, Sendo argues in the conclusion that Mongolia has now finally returned to, quote, a natural way of civilizational development, end quote. And here the important word in the Mongolian is jam yosni hokjis, meaning a natural form of development. And if I butcher any Mongolian pronunciation, I apologize in advance, it's bound to happen. Um, uh, okay, so from where we are standing, socialism appears to have been unnatural, a feverish dream imposed on the people, and now a ghost whose traces can be found scattered throughout the city. This talk, however, is not about chasing after the ghosts of the past, but about interrogating the idea that democracy and capitalism have fully exorcised the ghosts of ideology. In a series of lectures given by Jacques Derrida in 1992, at the height of the triumphal celebration of socialism's collapse and the advent of democracy, Derrida argued that the specter of Marx was still being conjured and conjured away, and that democracy disavowed its own ideological core, its own legitimating rituals, incantations, and formulas. So in today's talk, I want to argue that we are never free of ideology. But to understand this claim, we first have to 
understand that ideology isn't a set of false beliefs that we carry around in our head and that one day after seeing the truth we can leave behind. But as Slavoj Žižek puts it, ideology is the very coordinates of how we perceive and sense the world. Or to borrow from the anthropologist Clifford Geertz's definition, ideologies are, quote, sources of information, templates for the organization of social and psychological processes, end quote. So here I'm going out on a limb into, into some uncharted territory for myself, but I do find the Mongolian language to be very instructive philosophically here. In Mongolian, the word humujul, oh boy, humujul, <laughs> I, knew, I, knew, I knew this was going to happen, humujulik, I think I'm missing some uh, vowels in there. Okay, uh, to educate is a verbalization of the noun human, or hun, or humus, plural. So what I find interesting about this verbalization of the noun to be human is that to educate is actually to learn how to be human. In Mandarin Chinese, there is also a similar phrase, zuo ren, which literally means to make or to do or to perform a human and act according to a set of norms, rituals, and expectations. So what this ultimately means is that the human is not something we can take for granted, but it's something that is cultivated, educated, and made. So to return to Mongolian, we can even explore the semantic links between the word sorach, to learn and study, and its causative inversion, sortach, which means to, to domesticate animals. Learning to be human means, at some level, being domesticated. But domestication entails a relationship of power. Something is always being done to us. We are always being made from the outside. With this question in mind, we enter the scene of politics and the question according to which patterns are humans made from. If, being domestica if becoming human means to be domesticated according to a set of patterns, of behavior, then whoever makes those patterns and whoever designs our desire, whether it is Coco Chanel or a revolutionary political party, is a conduit of power and authority over the imaginary of a society. I put this screen up too early, but now we're getting to it. Um, and I don't think it is coincidental that the Mongolian words for ideology and advertisement, Uzal Sortal and Sortal Chilka, share the same roots with sortachun, which means morality and ethics. Political ideology of the state and advertisement in capitalism are two different ways to configure how to act and what to desire. As the psychoanalyst Lacan famously put, desire is the desire of the other. Or to put it more simply, we desire as our own what we think others desire and want from us. So in today's talk, I will argue that the 20th century socialist experiment under the control of Leninist political parties in Mongolia, the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China and elsewhere, were organized around an explicit conceptualization and practice of ideology, not as a rigid dogma or set of beliefs, but as a template for how to organize desire. So to paraphrase the art theorist Boris Groys, the vanguard Leninist party viewed itself as an artist whose mission was to draw the blueprints of the new society and the new human being, which does not mean that ideology went away after the transition to democracy, only that no one talks about it anymore. So I want to argue that the socialist era's desire to create new human beings through the construction of new built environments lives on today in the project or the projected vision of Ulaanbaatar's urban development, and particularly in the discourse of Gare district redevelopment and the process of apartmentalization or Orensochtolach. Of course, there are very many differences between the socialist period and today's neoliberal visions of the urban. And these differences are important and I will gesture at them later in the talk. But my main point here that I can't emphasize enough is that both the socialist era as well as the contemporary period 
participate in ideologies of the urban as a kind of dream world which can deliver us from the problems and contradictions of the present. So for the rest of the talk, I will look closely at documents, films, and artworks from the socialist period in Mongolia to explore how the city was imagined before and during its process of being built and how desire to live in the city was cultivated in a nomadic society. How Ikure, the great encampment, became Olanbatar, the red hero of socialist modernity. And in the conclusion, I will return to how UB is imagined today as a city in crisis, or as the former president Elbigdorch put it before leaving office as a city without a future in need of urban development. So, last year I was in the Mongolia National Archives and stumbled across a file from Mongolia's Ideological Commission on Cinema, dated from 1964. These files do not only discuss the quotas for what kinds of movies, what kinds of topics should be filmed, and what topics are off limits, but are also, in their own right, explorations of the relationship between ideology, cinema, and desire. They are, in fact, a continuation of Lenin's statement in a letter to Lunacharsky from February 1922, where Lenin wrote, you must remember always that of all the arts, the most important for us is cinema, end quote. So that's a really good question of why Lenin in the early 90s saw in cinema the main vehicle of Soviet ideology. And the file, I would suggest, actually gives us some insight into how to answer that question and to, into how film was conceptualized in the socialist era as containing a sublime power, the ability to enchant, the ability to teach, and the ability to provide models of the future that were only then blossoming in the heart of the present. The very fact that the Leninist party states recognized cinema's ideological potential is also what made them paranoid about its subversive potential and compelled them to censor and control it. For these reasons, I would like to share with you some of the quotes from the archival materials. So I just also want to stress that point that it was, that it was precisely this awe of cinema that created the paranoid apparatus of censorship at the same time. So in this 1964 uh, transcript of meetings that were held about uh, the relationship between ideology and cinema, one of the first lines describes movies as, quote, the organization of dreams and desires, end quote, and for the education of new human beings, end quote. So here again, in the original Mongolian text, we have the word humujulich, which as, as suggested above, not only means to educate, but means to learn how to be human. So cinema has the power and the potential to educate because it is, quote, reachable and understandable, end quote, by a mass public who does not need to be literate to hear the words and to see the movement projected on the screen. When people go to the movies, they are participating in the, quote, poetic dreams and ideology of the public, end quote. As a result of this participation, the audience begins to imagine itself as well as see the world differently. A new world comes into vision. The report continues that, quote, the art of cinema leaves deep imprints on ideology and on public custom, end quote. So the word used for, that I'm loosely translating as public custom um, that was used in the original is hev yos, which is a term that was popular in the socialist period but has since disappeared from common usage. Nonetheless, I still find it to be a very interesting term uh, conceptually, especially if we break it down and look at each word separately. Hev meaning template, pattern and shape, and yos, meaning custom, habit, ceremony. In this linguistic construction, we can actually hear 
how cinema is understood as a site for the production of the rituals, for production of the customs and habits of the new public, for models of behavior and for modes of desire. To go back to Garrett, cinema becomes a conduit or a relay between information about the world and the interior psychology and desire. In the uh, report, they also use interesting language uh, suggesting that when you go to watch a movie, there's a kind of porous border between the external world and the internal uh, psychological subjectivity. And some of the words they use are that the cinema um, soaks, shingach, uh, soaks into the sensory uh, of the individual, and that cinema can also setkel uh, hurch, or reach or touch the heart. So cinema has the ability to move from the external world that's being projected into one's interior world of desires and dreams and projections. So during the socialist period, movies were not intended only to reflect the present, but to provide a glimpse of the future which the present would become. The future needed to be announced on the screen before it could become a reality. So to quote once again from the report, the sublime goal of cinema, and here they use in, in Mongolia in the words, erkhum zorult, so this, this sublime uh, mission of cinema is the struggle to create new roles of the new people growing up in the great struggle and labor, end quote. So here we actually have a very complex model of temporality and subject formation in which the future gives form to the emergent tendencies of the present. To put it another way, probably a more confusing way, the future recursively acts on the present to give birth to itself. Models are distilled from unfolding historical events, struggles, and tendencies, and then projected onto the movie screen, which provides people with inspiration and orientation for how to act. So the cinematic screen becomes a site of subject formation. The cinema tricks us into believing that desire originates from inside of ourselves rather than from the world around us. But of course, it is always possible to get up and leave during a movie. It's possible not to be impressed and not to relate at all to the characters in the script and to feel cold by the movie-going experience. It could be said then that the cinematic screen is never a blank one, but is always interacting with the desires and expectations we take with us into the movie theater. And the ideological commission wasn't ignorant of this fact. Actually, they argued in the report that movies didn't only have to be politically correct, but had to appeal and engage the interests of their audience. The new that they were trying to introduce had to surreptitiously announce itself from within the already familiar. The commission report worried that the directors would only appeal to superficial plot devices for the sake of entertainment and would forget that their goal as directors is to balance this vision of the new future and political ideology with what people already expected and understood and were familiar with. And so to quote again from the report, um, instead of showing the contradictions of mind and heart, scriptwriters focus on artificial actions far from the truth of life. In these kinds of movies, they do not show characters which could provide good examples of the good sides of people, end quote. And I want to argue that here, we run up against the limit of the logic of the model. How does a model contain within itself the contradictions of the present and the becoming future of the present? 
Um, this is a very complicated question that I address in the paper on which this talk is based, but we're going to have to leave it aside for now, and I could talk about it in the Q&A if anybody wants. Um, but it's something to, 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 to think about. In the rest of the paper, I would like to now put the, um, this more conceptual talk about ideology and about cinema as a way of desire into concrete um, examination of the history of the construction of Ulaanbaatar as both a dream world of the future and as a city in a permanent state of construction, always attempting to catch up to its ideal. By using the term dream world, I do not mean that it's just some kind of fantasy detached from and floating above reality, but that it is the core around which reality is organized. As Susan Buck Morris put it so beautifully in her book on the Soviet Union called Dream World in Catastrophe, quote, the dream was itself an immense material power that transformed the natural world, investing industrial produced objects and built environments with political desire, end quote. In UB, the dream world was created through a series of discourses and aesthetic sensibilities, urban planning documents, newspaper articles calling on Mongolians to work in construction, movies, and artworks. The dream world in the Mongolian context is also important because urbanization in the socialist period was an administrative creation rather than a process driven by industrialization and migration. It was also an intervention into Mongolia's pastoral political economy and traditional nomadic lifestyle. Thus, the urban construction of UB in the 1950s and 60s, especially, was not only about building the city, solving problems of labor shortages and construction materials, but was also about cultivating in the people a desire to live in the city. So if we think about UB according to this logic of the model, then the city needs to be imagined. It needs to be projected, represented, and felt as much as it needs to be lived in and built. In 1959, the Mongolian State Construction Commission published a report on the status of urban construction in Mongolia, which is worth quoting from. In a short period of history, the role of construction workers is very large. To change local centers in villages which are covered with broken ruins, efterhi balgas, and garbage, ahog novsh, and also to change the city, dahure, which was the trade center of foreign conquerors and monasteries and temples of the Buddhist religion. Construction workers are engaged in this great work or ich ajil, of building and transforming the underdeveloped capital city, Hosurtsun da Hurre, and other Sum centers, and making the appearance of the city something new and unrecognizable. And so here we have a cartoon from the Tonshul uh, magazine where you can see the capitalist, feudalist, and socialist and the projection of the, 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 the sturdy uh, being built on top, of the, um, on top of the ruins of the older societies. In the passage, though, that I just read from, we should pay attention to the, to the discourse that's being used and how the future of the city is contrasted with the ruins of the past. But where then does this leave the present? The present moment of construction is viewed as a disappearing stage, understood both temporally as a historical transition and aesthetically as a display. People are able to go to construction sites to witness and anticipate and start to desire the city that is emerging and coming into being before their eyes. Through the lens of the future, the past is retroactively perceived as embarrassing ruins, and the present is understood as a self-transcending sign of progress. 
urban construction becomes an ideological process of learning how to see the city and learning how to live time as an anticipation for the future that is always around the corner. To come back to the art theorist Boris Groys, who grew up in the Soviet Union, he um, discusses time in the Soviet Union along these lines. Quote, the present as such, was mostly seen in the context of modernity as something negative, as something that should be overcome in the name of the future, show, something that slows down the realization of our projects, something that delays the coming of the future. One of the slogans of the Soviet era was time forward, end quote. So I disagree slightly with Groys, just because what I want to argue is that in the present, the... Um, construction activity could be viewed positively as a scaffolding in which the future is being built and materialized. The problem is when the scaffolding, th oh, here's the scaffolding. <laughs> the problem is when the scaffolding threatens to become permanent and when the construction projects remain unfinished and frozen in time. When people line up for years to have a chance to move into apartments, but never actually get the new apartment because of the queues. And you can see this nice cart cartoon from 1964, also from Tonschild magazine. That when the construction itself becomes permanent and constantly delayed, desire begins to deflate into cynicism and frustration. But we're not quite there yet, historically. In the early 1960s, we can still glimpse signs of the future coming into being. Take, for example, the following poem uh, published in Unin Sonnen in November 1964. And to spare y'all my uh, terrible pronunciation of Mongolian, I'm just going to read the English translation. On the back of the Bagtan mountain in the valley of the Tul River, a modern city is expanding outward. Sections of the old city with mud and wooden buildings, monasteries and temples, many tattered gares. So next to this poem in the newspaper, and the quality wasn't that great, so I'm not reproducing the images here, but they have a juxtaposition of the new urban buildings and apartments, and then old kind of tattered looking gares. Remember this juxtaposition because I'm going to return to it in the conclusion when I talk about gare district redevelopment. So the old city is still actually necessary as a reminder of its difference with the future. The mud houses, the tattered gares are signs of what is being steadily demolished and overcome and replaced by the modernity in the new buildings expanding outward. Even if this kind of language may sound alien to many of you, I suggest it is no more nor less ideological than the discourses we read about echo cities, smart cities, Gair district redevelopment, tourist destinations of global capital, and the ways in which they are imagined and talked about as superseding the problems and contradictions of the present. Ideology doesn't go away. In this paper, I will talk a little bit, oh, in the paper that this talk is based on, I go uh, into some length of talking about Mongolia's relationship with China and the presence of Chinese construction workers in the city. As many of you probably already know, Chinese workers uh, were responsible for the construction of Peace Bridge, the original State Department store, and many other apartment buildings in the late 50s and early 60s. And then after Mongolia and China had a falling out in 1962, and most of the workers left, Mongolia was faced with a crisis of enticing Mongolians to become construction workers and to fill the void left behind by the Chinese. I'm going to skip over most of this section, but I want to mention how important this also was in the document from the Ideological Film Commission, where they actually refer to, quote, construction workers are considered the saviors, or avraksh, 
of socialism in Mongolia, end quote. And the reason why is because they were the ones building the future. And this is why films needed to be made about glorifying construction in urban environments. In 1963, Unin Sonin also published a long editorial calling on all Mongolians to engage in construction work as a national duty. Quote, construction work is everyone's work. Helping out in the construction center in order to make Ulaanbaatar a city more beautiful is the highest honor for all citizens, end quote. So in these slides, uh, and this is the slide for the advertisement for today's talk, we can see a series of paintings from 1964. Uh, almost everything I'm talking about today is like 1963 or 1964. Uh, from 1964, glorifying construction workers. These socialist realist paintings, however, were not simply abstract peons to labor, but they were ideological arguments in which Mongolians were called upon to see themselves in new and unfamiliar ways. So we can actually see in this painting, one of the construction workers on the left here is wearing Mongolian style clothing while holding in his hand a welding, hel a welding helmet, suturing together both traditional as well as modern elements. In both paintings, the expressions on the faces of the construction workers glow with pride and a sense of dignity. While we are talking about construction workers, I want to just skip ahead slightly to the late 1970s and the song that my good friend Erdin Ocher brought to my attention uh, called Honchin Bairflagchin. Hoir? Is Hoir in the title? I don't remember. Uh, so the song about uh, herders and construction workers from the late 70s. I haven't been able to pinpoint what exact year the song was made. But the song is about lovers who are a construction worker and a herder singing about how they are dedicated to their work, but also the same time as a metaphor for the marriage between the city and the countryside and both of their professions. And I think when we're starting to imagine the relationship between the city and the countryside in Mongolia, these kinds of um, socialist representations are actually extraordinarily interesting. And so I'm just going to quote um, two verses from the song. I definitely will not sing it. Um, I, uh, so in one verse, uh, the construction worker sings, I received a duty of sublime creation to build up tall and beautiful construction, working hard on masonry, I am exceeding my own daily norm. And then at the end of the song, they sing together, worshiped my own sacred and honest labor, raised up people who are workers and herders, the wedding of both of us, herder and construction worker, will be held in the countryside or the city. And I think this is interesting because here we have a different kind of vision and ideology of the relationship between uh, city and countryside, tradition and modernity that also occurs in the 1959 film, I Wish I Had a Horse or Mortoich um, Borosoy, but I'm going to leave a discussion of that film uh, to the side. We could talk about it later if you want. When it comes to thinking about the urban, these images present us with different modes of perception and aesthetic appreciation. But basically, we have other images here from 1964 of workers installing public lighting infrastructure. And I'm particularly fond of this image for the main reason that when we think about problems of the Gare districts today in UB, one of the problems is connection to public infrastructure, heating, sewage disposal, and so forth. And here in this socialist realist image, we see a kind of care to public infrastructure and public space. And we see a kind of aesthetic investment in it as an object worth painting about, which is not something we think about today. Um, then just these pictures I wanted to show up close. Uh, this is 1974, carved in ivory, which tells a story of the development of UB from breaking the kind of feudal past. And then here we have the apartment buildings and the industries together. Okay, so now one of the most famous films from the socialist period 
stages the cultivation of desire to live in the city. And that film is the 1963 comedy Amenhur or Harmonica, which tells the story of the mother who refuses to move into a new apartment and leave behind her old uh, Hasha Baishin, uh, which she built with her father. Besides the sentimental attachment to her house, she views the noise and chaos of urban construction with suspicion. In the opening scene, she appears harassed and disoriented as she navigates her way through the construction. To her, urban construction not only menaces her safety, but appears to belong to a foreign world. So I actually have the movie up on my computer, um, but to save time, I, I, if we have time in the q and I'll come back and show a two or three minute uh, clip from this movie and in this scene where the mother is walking home and looking terrified by all of the construction happening around her. And then the minute she opens the door to her own uh, Baishin, she just breathes this sigh of disgust and relief and then goes inside and closes the door. And I love that there's a sigh at the end. It's a really beautiful scene, and I hope I can show it with you later. So she's clearly threatened by this urban environment being built around her. And the process of ideological conversion is necessary. What occasions the mother's change of heart is pressure from her daughter, who is teased by her classmates for living in such threadbare conditions. The daughter's boyfriend is also conveniently a construction worker. Reluctantly, the mother gives in to her daughter's pleas and the family moves into a new apartment. After the mother falls in love with the new apartment, the city itself changes in appearance in the film. It no longer appears as an alien menace. Instead, there are montages of joyful construction workers diligently at work, accompanied by optimistic musical scores, sonorously carrying the viewer into the future. I also have that clip, which is about two minutes, which we could come back to um, later. And there are a ton of incredible things going on in that scene. And this brings me to my current research and where the book project that I am working on starts from. How is Ulaanbaatar imagined today? What are the images and the discourses that influence its construction? Why is apartmentalization or Oren Sostolach come to seen by many as the answer and solution for all of UB's problems and for Ger district redevelopment? The other day, my research assistant and I were walking in the Gare districts and started talking to a grandmother and her granddaughter who were standing in front of this new apartment building that is being constructed. When we asked her why she was looking at the building, the grandmother replied, quote, every evening when I go to pick up my granddaughter from school, on the way back home, we stop here at this new building and I wonder to myself, when can I finally move into my new apartment?" End quote. And I couldn't help but think of the first scene from Amenhor, an almost picture-perfect contrast with the scene today. Gare District redevelopment is also advertised in terms of the future, a future without air pollution, a future of rows of apartments. And like the descriptions I shared earlier during the socialist period, it is contrasted with a stigmatization, which in this case is not the feudal past, but the presence of Gare districts. In one of the brochure materials given to me by a construction company working on Gare district redevelopment, which I didn't reproduce here because there are too many identifying markers of the country, of the, of the company, um, there are two pages in this brochure with the heading, The Real Situation of Gare Districts. And they could not have possibly chosen more unflattering images of cramped gares, baishin, piled up on top of each other, muddy roads, blankets of pollution, and overall squalid living conditions to magnify the sense of poverty. On the next page, however, is the overall plan from redevelopment 
which is geometrically ordered rows of apartment buildings, green space, and aesthetically beautiful, according to this metric. What is also interesting about these computer-generated models is that they appear as if they are self-contained islands disconnected from the rest of the city. Here, too, I can't help but think of the poem from Unin Sonnen in the early 1960s, imagining this beauty that grows up and out of the rubble. But this is also somewhat misleading, and I want to go out on a limb here and venture the claim that in the socialist era, Although many people lived in gares in the cities waiting for their apartments to be built, there was less of a dichotomization and less of a stigmatization than there is today. At that time, gares were viewed as transitory accommodations, even though in reality, most people lived there as de facto permanent dwellings. In the state construction report from 1959 that I quoted earlier, they discuss urban gares as necessary aspects of urban construction. Quote, by this way of constructing apartments, we can free society from its conditions of late development of the old society and transfer the workers and laborers into new homes from Eskinger, from felt gares. The famous Mongolianist Owen Lattimore also observed a similar phenomena on his visit, phenomenon on his visit in the early 1960s, where he observes, quote, because the population in UB has grown too fast for the builders to keep up, there are still many wooden fenced rectangles in which people live in the old round white Mongol tents, which makes striking contrast with modern buildings, end quote. Although people lived in gares under socialism in UB, I suggest that it's only in the democratic period that the term gare district or gare horolo becomes a term that is named as a sociological entity and geographical space and also as the location of a crisis that requires state intervention. Due to air pollution, soil pollution, other considerations, GARE districts become negatively represented in mainstream discourse as not belonging to the city proper, even though they take up most of the space of the city, as even threatening the city from its edges and surrounding it. As a friend pointed out to me, on social media, anti-air pollution discourse often takes the form of blaming GARE district residents and urging them to stop burning coal or go back to the countryside. Even the dominant definition of gare districts as devoid of infrastructure uh, and lack, uh, lacking attachment to, to the um, central heating and sewage reproduces the imagination of gare districts as something apart from and not belonging to the city, even though they house the majority of urban residents and take up most of the city's surface area. Here are some images of Gare districts from the socialist era. Of course, this is not to say that Ulaanbaatar doesn't face several crises ranging from air pollution to soil pollution to water shortages to lack of adequate public services and so on. But my question is, why is the solution to these crises, why does it take the form of apartments? Why does the urban necessarily take the form of rows upon rows of apartment buildings? Are there other ways to imagine the city, to imagine democratically living and sharing space together? Of course, there are also practical considerations as whether or not the city's infrastructure could support full-scale apartmentalization and other important questions such as whether or not moving Gare District residents into apartments would address problems of unemployment, economic distress, and precarity, or it would just displace them into apartments. The importance of digging, in conclusion, this is my last paragraph, I promise. Um, here is this little air pollution thing. Here's the city. Oh, we'll go back to this distressing image. Uh, the importance, no, let's do, okay, there we go. The importance of digging around in the archive of the past is not to be nostalgic or to believe that we could ever set back the clock and return to the socialism of the 20th century. But it is to be aware of the fact that different futures 
are always possible. That it is also why we need to discuss ideology. Again, not as an accusation and not as something to be ashamed of, but as a site for the production of new dream worlds, of new public imaginaries, including the kinds of cities we want to inhabit. A site of democratic contest contestation over our shared values and the kind of public we are and want to become and represent ourselves as being. We return to the past, if only to slightly lift from our shoulders the weight of the present. Thank you. Uh. <laughs>